Welcome to Spotlight. I'm your host, Fitzroy Prendergas. In this week's program, we'll be featuring the general manager of Victoria Mutual Wealth Management Limited, Mr. Devon Barrett. Welcome to Spotlight, Devon. Well, thank you very much, Victoria. All right. First of all, we want you to tell us a little bit about Devon Barrett. Tell us about you know, your upbringing, where you were born, and the school you attended. Okay, so Devon Barrett is a 40 odd years old <laughs> young man okay. from Kingston. I've been, I was born in Kingston and I've been here forever. And um, I went to the great <laughs> school down on North Street. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I know, the, I know the rivals like you like to hear that, you know, <laughs> where the brave will fall but never yield. Okay. So I'm a KC man. Okay. And, you know, that to me is something that I've sold um, for as long as I've been around because I think that's sort of the, the attitude that I want to expose, that the brave will fall but never yield. Yeah. So that's, that's Devon Barrett. Now, um, you left Kingston College and you went on to university, I suppose. University of the West Indies, Mona. Mm -hmm. and so after KC, I went to... Uh, to U the University of the West Indies, Mona, and then to Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. What was that the experience like for you? Well, I think it was a good one where we had the classes, um, some of the classes here in Jamaica, and then you go to Fort Lauderdale for the final um, part of the program. So it was a good experience both here locally and in Fort Lauderdale. And what did you major in? It was just finance um, at the time. So you always wanted to be involved in finance? I sort of just got into it when I left, um, when I left high school, mm -hmm. and I've loved it ever since. Okay. Well, tell us about your, your parents. Were they uh, encouraging you in that direction, or they left you to decide what you want to do at Kingston College? Well, interestingly, my parents, I had an older brother, and um, he was in the sciences. So at first I was down the, science, the road of the sciences, but then after a while I say uh, that was definitely not my interest. So I kind of switched my interest to the business side of things. And that's where I kind of got my start in business. Just the like of accounting and economics and those things that I thought were kind of relative, you know, to what is going on in the economy. Those things that people could see and touch. It's a little different from the sciences where it's a little nebulous. You might not be able to touch it and see it until later on. Great. Now, so you went to the University of the West and majored in finance. And you came out of school. What next? What was it? What was the next um, sojourn for Devon Barrett? So what happened was that I got into the financial sector when there was going to be when there was about to be a turn in the whole um, system. That turn was the liberalisation of the economy back in the in the early nineties, right? And so what emerged then was a new industry about to be formed, which is now known as the securities industry. So I was in the banking sector working at Citizens Bank at the time, right? And the banking business itself was interesting, but it really got much more interesting when the liberalization took place back in the early 90s, as I said. So that's, that's, that's where I started my Why do you think that it got more interesting during the liberalization phase? Because I think at the time what we, what we found was that a new economy was about to emerge. Jamaica needed to raise money, and the international market was a place to raise money. So what you needed was a really developed securities industry to help you to do that. The whole world had gone that route before, and we were still um, behind. So that was going to be the new direction, and a lot of people saw it back then. So you had a stint at Citizens Bank, and mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that stint at Citizens Bank. So it was my first real job, and it was, um, to me, one of good, real good experience. Because Citizens Bank was one of the smaller banks then, and we had to do all these innovative things to kind of get up to the, the bigger banks. So the big banks focused on some things, and we decided that we're going to focus on those things plus more to kind of get up to speed with the bigger banks. So it was, it was really an interesting experience for me. Okay. So Citizens Bank um, had a good experience there, and then to BMBS? No. I, I made a couple of stops okay. al al along the way. One of those stops was uh, Capital and Credit um, Merchant Bank and the Capital and Credit Securities. Mm -hmm. If you remember, Capital and Credit was one of the pioneers in the securities business. So after liberalization, some, of the, some new companies emerged, Jamaica Money Market Brokers, Capital and Credit uh, Merchant Bank. Then you had other primary dealers coming into play at the time. So Capital and Credit Merchant Bank at the time was sort of one of the bigger players in the market 
So I joined them probably about five or six years in. And that was another place now where I wanted to you know, make a difference, to go and make some growth. And that happened with you now the switch of the banking business from the securities business. That was another interesting switch that I think a lot of people didn't even realize happened. But that happened just about the year 2000, 2001. So that was a, the big thing that was happening then. Were you intricately involved with the separation? Tell us a little bit about your knowledge of the separation of the bank itself, because it's interesting that you started to work at Citizens Bank. So you had a great idea of what, what the banking structure looked like. Yes. And to, to, to give the, the viewers an understanding of the separation, how they, how they can exist um, separately. So the separation was necessary because what you wanted to do was to have the industry focused in different direction. So it was one big thing known as the financial services industry. But what was required was to kind of have the focus in separate directions, specialization, so that you can, one, move the risk in different direction. That was a big, big real issue for doing all this, moving the risk. Because what you had was a situation where investors all invested in all of these banking type products under one roof. But then you had small investors who were taking the risk that only bigger investors should be taken. And so the decision to split the banking sector would now have the small investors stick with the banking or traditional business, while the bigger investors would now take the risk in the securities industry. So that is what the whole switch was all about. And Capital and Credit was one of the first to make that switch in the business. What was your role as Capital and Credit a Merchant Bank? So I, when I joined Capital and Credit Merchant Bank, I was a Senior Vice President for Investments. And in about a year or so into that assignment, we decided to make the, the switch of the industry. And I took over the role of General Manager of Capital and Credit Securities Limited. So Capital and Credit Securities emerged out of Capital and Credit Merchant Bank. So my role was to now take Capital and Credit Securities from the ground and grow it um, at the end of the day. And take, take us through some of the, the little um, the successes you felt you had at Capital and Credit Merchant Bank. Investment, um, security, sorry. Take us through some of the successes that you felt you had. Okay, so one of the big things for us was to kind of change the direction of the business Capital and Credit Securities. The business Capital and Credit Securities looked a lot like Capital and Credit Merchant Bank and other banks because what you had was everybody doing the same thing called intermediation. So we were taking short-term liabilities and investing in longer-term assets, but predominantly financial assets like bonds and those, and those things. What was changed then, what my role was, was to change this from doing just strictly intermediation because that carried, out, carried with it a lot of financial capital risk, whereby if the assets fell in value, you would end up taking a lot of the hit on your balance sheet, and that could cause significant harm to the business. So my role was to change that to the point where a lot of the investments were taking place off the books. What that means is that the clients who formed the liabilities would now be buying the assets in there for themselves. And having bought the assets for themselves, what that would mean is that they would take on more risk, or they would get more returns. That was the key. And that a role I think I played very well at Capital and Credit Securities Limited. And then where was the next journey? So our next step was Victoria Mutual Wealth Management. And I came to Victoria Mutual Wealth Management five years ago. And when I came here, it was again to take on that challenge of moving Victoria Mutual Wealth Management from being a strictly, a strictly a company that deals with intermediation to one that was focused more on brokerage. What brokerage in, the, in this context mean is that we are finding an opportunity for the clients who are looking to invest and those people who want to raise money. So we went out and we decided that we we're going to play that role. And I think over the, five, over the past five years, we have done what I think is a good enough job of getting to this point. So we have made a transition to the point where when we started five years ago, our business was predominant. When I started five years ago, the company was around before, before I got here. When I started five years ago, the strategy was to move those business from on the books to off the books. And what we're able to do is from, from then, where we had the repo product as our predominant product, now we have moved to the point where we have asset management as a major business, we have advisor services as a major business for us, we have bond trading as a major business for us, and, and those areas are, you know, have contributed significantly to our income flow. Brilliant. So 
these three key areas form the base of the wealth management art. Exactly. That is where we have kind of planted our, that's our roots. That is where we want to grow from going forward. And the main reason why we've targeted those areas, as I said, is one, it will, you, you can go exponentially with this. Because if you think about it, now you're using human capital versus financial capital. The financial capital came with a cost. That cost is usually prohibitive, one, and two, it always is limited. From economics, capital, financial capital is always limited. So our strategy is to go to a, a source of growth where the, the, inf the, in the input would not be limited. And so we have decided to take on the part of those off balance sheet activities where the clients will take on more of the risk, but they'll get more of the returns at the end of the day. Excellent. Now, I want to go through step by step for the viewers who will be watching this program, um, the three arms of the wealth management um, um, in detail so that somebody can understand, who, somebody outside who doesn't have the financial acumen that you know, other persons may have can understand how they can be a part of being wealth management. Okay, so, so let's talk about asset management as, right. a, as a first step. What we did with the asset management business is that we decided to create some create portfolios for clients that we would go out and manage and they would pay us for doing this. So what we're putting on the line right here is what we call the reputational risk of the business because if, the, if that fails to perform, then our reputation will take a hit from that. So what we're selling to clients is our expertise in this business. And what we're saying is, we've done this for the past 17, 18 years in VM Wealth Management and 130 years as a whole, 130 odd years as a whole for VMBS. So what we're saying is we can replicate this for you, the investor. So you must put your trust in us, pay us a fee for doing that, and we'll manage to give you good, the returns that we're making for ourselves. So we're applying the same techniques that we use in our business in, in to, to your business to give you good returns at the end of the day. So that's an asset management business. And, and by the way, we have broken that down so that everybody can participate. You have the small investors and you have the big investors. For the small investors, we have what is called our managed portfolio, right? And for the larger, invest, larger, um, larger persons, we have the portfolio management service. That is the one-on-one -on -one service. So we manage directly for you alone. While with the managed portfolio, you have one manager and 100, 1,000, 1 million investors to different strategies. How are clients taking to this? Um, well, we have found clients to be very receptive to this in, in recent times because now what is happening is that a couple of years ago, they, they could just sit down and buy a repo and get returns. What has happened now is that they can't just get those returns again because interest rates have fallen significantly. So what they're looking for is an opportunity where they'll continue to earn, but what we, have, what we have explained to them is that you're going to earn more, but you're going to be taking on some additional risk. A lot of clients have said, you know what, as long as you guide me along the path of managing that risk, then we will go with you. So the returns we think are good enough, and they, they invest in public are going with it on the basis that we'll help them to guide them through the risk involved. Right, so that's the, the asset, man asset management yes. base of the business. Next yes. is the, the advisory services advisory part services. of the business. This is a new area um, for us. I mean, new now. I mean, we've gone about two years in it, but it's, we still call it relatively new. What this area is, is that we go out and we find clients, and we say to them, listen, let us advise you on the best way to manage your business going forward. So what we do is that we take a look at your business right now, and we try to find out the intricacies of it, and then we make some recommendations for you going forward. One of the biggest problems we've found here in Jamaica is that a lot of companies are undercapitalized. So they have good business ideas, they have some good technically skilled um, persons on board, they have good underground everything. And what they lack is financial capital. And what we have said to them is, listen, we will help you to organize your business so that you can go out there and raise capital for the business. And when we go to raise the capital, we're not gonna go to the traditional commercial banks to raise that capital. Simply because the commercial banking, the lending from the commercial bank is not geared towards business. It's not that business friendly. The commercial banks have financial ratios that they have to keep up to. Businesses can't afford always to be putting out the, the cash that they earn into making loan payments. So what we have decided to do is to structure 
products for them that will give them the funding that they need. It could come in, in the form of debt capital or equity capital. Equity capital is, the most, is more desirable, but a lot of people here in Jamaica do not really want to share their business. And you know, they have to give up some of the ownership of their business when that happens. On the other side of it, debt capital comes with some obligation to pay interest that we have guided them away from because you don't, you don't want to use up the cash flow in the business to be paying all these interest payments. So what we have said to the investor, to, the, to those, those clients, are listen, we'll help you to raise money in the best way that we see, whether it's uh, all equity, all debt, or a mix of equity and debt. And then what we do next is to turn to the investing public and say, here's an opportunity to earn from what we call the real sector, not the paper sector which you invest in government paper and so on. This is the real sector where you are seeing a company out there that is manufacturing drinks, soups, whatever it is that they're manufacturing. We are saying to the public, you have an opportunity to invest in this company through either debt or equity. And the returns that the companies make will come directly to you and you'll get some good returns. So this is a win-win for everybody and what it does is to take the business that was traditionally done by the, the commercial banks, right, and move it into a space that makes the, the entrepreneur more comfortable and the investor happier with the returns that they get from it. I'm interested in... Cable News and Sports wants you to learn while you watch. And so the number one cable news and sports channel in the island brings you the best news and sports documentaries in Documentary Corner weekdays at 3 p.m. Improve your knowledge of world events by watching the largest catalog of news and sports documentaries anywhere in the island on Cable News and Sports weekdays at 3 p.m. The Documentary Corner is aired on Sundays at 10 a.m. Are you having a wedding, a funeral, a graduation, or just about any other function? Then let InFocus Productions provide you with professional video and photographic services from anywhere in the island at the best possible price. InFocus Productions also offer PA system and projector screen rentals. Call us at 949-5326, 949-4331, or 276-7825. So for all your video and photographic services, plus PA system and projector screen rentals, it's in Focus Productions, where your function is in our focus. Join Cable News and Sports on Mondays at 6.20 p.m. for UN in Action. UN in Action gives you a glimpse at some of the work of the United Nations as they seek to reduce poverty and foster development in developing countries across the globe. UN in Action every Monday at 6.20 p.m. on your News and Sports Authority, Cable News and Sports. Every Monday at 6.05 p.m., Cable News and Sports brings you Inside the World Bank. Get an insight into the mission of the World Bank as they fund some of the world's major projects to assist in economic development. We estimate at the bank that even a mild epidemic will reduce world GDP by 0.7. Inside the World Bank, Mondays at 6.05 p.m. on your News and Sports Authority, Cable News and Sports. What you said a while ago about some companies in Jamaica really don't want to share their business, and so they're reluctant about um, equity um, investment. Um, why is this so though? Is, well, there, is there a culture that um, inhibits expansion in, in, in Jamaica? I, I think it's a culture and a part of the Jamaican investor, the, the Jamaican entrepreneur, where he doesn't really, he's grown to believe that his business is his, right? And so he, he probably learned that from he was a child and it's going to be hard to kind of change some of that. But what, we're, what we've said to them is listen, let us just sit down and help you with this. Use a simple example. You may own 100% of this business right now. 
but this is just a small business with $50 million of, of business. But if you were able to expand this business by admitting new capital, then this business could double to $100 million worth of business. So instead of owning 100% of a small business, you may now own 50% of a much larger business. So this is an opportunity for you to grow significantly and exponentially, right? While not giving away your business, because this is what a lot of people feel, that they'll be giving away their business, one, and two, people will come in and try to take over their business. We're saying to them, listen, you can still retain ownership of the business by owning 51% of the business, for instance, and you still now own a bigger business at the end of the day. So I think that is something that we've had the most challenge with in recent times, to kind of get the Jamaican entrepreneur to understand the need to admit new capital and new blood in the business. So is it that the wealth management arm of Victor Mutual goes to the stock market and uh, um, raises, um, puts clients on the stock market to raise capital? That's part of what you do? Is that right. So yes, we're a member of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. We hold a seat on the Jamaica Stock Exchange and we help to raise capital to the, the stock market. But that is the equity debt that I talk, talked about a while ago. The other debt is, um, is the fixed income debt that is not now listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, but in the future will be. So, so what is happening now is that companies have debt, have raised monies in the form of equities. They turn to the, to the local market and they list that, local stock market, and they list that on the market. What listing means is that you have put it on a board where other persons who are not yet involved could come and buy into it. So a lot of the process that is required right now in a, in a private business is taken away when you create a market for, these, for, these, for these, this business. So simply put, as an investor, you could walk into there and say, I want to buy some shares of Carreras, Grace Kennedy, Jamaica Money Market Brokers, and any of those companies that have been listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And you could buy as, as small as 100 units of those. When if this was a private business, there's no way you could get to buy 100 units from Jamaica, uh, any of these companies. So the stock exchange, Jamaica stock market, we think is a good place for small investors to go and find good opportunities to buy into companies, right? With regards to the debt instruments, while some of them are coming onto the exchange right now, more in the future will be coming. You have preference shares that are listed on the exchange right now, just like ordinary shares. And the preference shares are being uh, are sort of the, the debt instruments right now on that exchange. So that is where the market has gone, and we're looking for it to emerge going forward in the future. Excellent. Now, the other side, the, the, the third arm of the business is the... The bond trading bond business. Trading. Tell us about that. And what we're talking about is the exposure directly to the assets, right? And let me explain, let's give a simple example. Right now, clients walk in here, and they buy a repurchase agreement. What a repurchase agreement says is that I sell you this asset, with the understanding that I will buy it back from you in 30 days, 60 days, whatever the agreed period is. So for that time, you own the asset. An analogy here is if you rented a car or a house or, or something, right? So you own the assets for that period and then you give it back to me at the end of the period. Now with the case of the, do, these repurchase agreements are backed by bonds more, for the most part. Now what we're saying to the clients is listen, when you buy a repurchase agreement, you invest for the short term, and so you get a return that is commensurate with the, with the timeline that you've invested. So you might get 3% on an, on an instrument, on, on a repurchase agreement, that is backed by an asset earning 8%. So there's a 5 percentage point spread in there that is had by somebody else that is not you. We're saying to the investing public, listen, take some of this risk longer term. Instead of putting all your monies in the short term repo market, take the portion of it that you do not need now and buy the longer term assets. Having bought those longer term assets, what you'll get is a move up in your interest yield from 3% to probably 6 or 7%. So the spread that somebody has had before, you will now be getting it. How are they responding to it? The well, we have seen that positive response again because a lot of people bought repurchase agreements because they just didn't understand what was going on. And the yields were good enough for them at the time. But now that the yields have, have gone down to 2 or 3%, they have, they're they now looking for other investment opportunities. Now, it's, thank you very much for going that route. Because you know, 
you want the ordinary person to understand um, what the wealth management arm of it usually does. Now, in terms of getting these persons to consistently invest, you've got an economy that I would suggest to you is sluggish and not doing as well as you know we would all hope. Now, how difficult is it for a wealth management arm to ensure that it's meeting its bottom line, doing very well in a very, very tough economy? Well, our strategy, as I pointed out at the start, is that we are moving away from simply being a broker of government or Jamaica instruments. We want to see real growth in the economy. And our strategy for that real growth is to go around to all these companies out there and say to them, tell me about your business. Once they've told us, we've give, we start giving them some prescriptions as to how they can go forward. So the biggest problem that we have found outside of the cost of electricity and those other things that affect them is that they're undercapitalized. So we're saying to them, this is the absolute best time to raise capital out there in the marketplace so that you could grow your business. What this growth in their business would do is to substitute a lot of the imports that we have right now, which is a, another big problem for us because the dollar is going almost $100 now, and it's just because we have to spend so much on import of not just um, utilities, but on food. So we're saying there's an absolute opportunity out there for you to move away from importing all of this by producing it locally. And like I said, when we look on a lot of the manufacturing entities out there, the problem with them is that they're undercapitalized. If they were better capitalized, they could, un they could really take care of some of the difficulties that they're having right now with producing to meet the local market at a competitive price. So that is what, that is what we are focused on right now, and we think we're gonna, this is going to take us a far way down the road to keep our business model alive. How the, the junior market is a new phenomenon, yes. obviously, and I'm sure you're looking at that as well. Sure. Um, give me your perspective on the junior market and the potential it has to certainly um, propel small businesses into a new dimension, so to speak. Well, I think it was an excellent idea to go the route of the junior market because before the junior market, it was a challenge to get onto the senior market for smaller, less sophisticated companies. So what the junior market really is a sort of diluted version of the senior market. But it comes with some good opportunities. One, the big one is the tax break that these companies get where they pay no tax for the first five years, half of the re required taxes for the second five years, and then they move to full taxes after 10 years of business. Now, the biggest problem with the junior market, though, is to find companies that are organized enough to go to that market. And the organization that I'm talking about here is what I talked about earlier, where a lot of the principals of these companies don't want to share their business with anybody else. And so what we've said to them is, listen, this opportunity not just allows you to grow the business even bigger enough. Think about what you get. You get that tax break for the first 10 years of the business. So we're saying the junior market is an excellent opportunity, not just for those companies who see themselves as ready, but those, that, those, those persons who think they have a good idea and they want to raise some monies to execute on that idea. So it's a perfect time and it's a perfect opportunity in my mind. When you look at the, um, the, the wealth management arm and you analyze um, the three facets that really make up this um, company, the potential to grow to grow this company beyond what it is now. What are your prospects for wealth management services in Jamaica totally, and certainly for VMBS wealth management? Okay, so so we think this is this is the, the ideal time for our business. The, the, just look on the conditions. Interest rates are pretty low, so any investor who walks in right now and wants to make an investment is going to find that the investment opportunities are really not the best right now. On the other side of it, we have a major problem in this country where we are looking for growth and we can't find growth. We have a big situation where we're importing all so much, we have so much imports that our trade deficit is just out of whack. So what we're saying is we see a big opportunity now to bring the two together and once we can get them going together, then this business is going to grow exponentially. 
So if you think about what happened with the securities market 20 years ago or more, when they, after liberal, liberalization, I see this as the next big market for our local economy. And this is something that will just significantly change the way we do business. So now instead of government being the major borrower, you could have the private sector and the smaller companies becoming the major buyer in the marketplace. And the, in, the import substitution that we're looking for, we could get it. The growth that we're looking for, we could get it. And then we could focus on all the other things simultaneously, like getting the energy costs down and so on. But we can't stop to wait for energy costs to come down before we say we can do these things. Most of the manufacturers that I go to have a good opportunity right now to kind of change their business model. But they have to be up to it. They really have to be. How do you wrestle with the lack of confidence in the economy as you pursue what um, seems to be a phenomenal um, business model in terms of, you know, you struggle on the one hand, there are businesses with the potential to move forward, but there, there's this level of uncertainty that permeates and hinders um, persons taking risk and so on. Um, what do you say to a client? Well, again, our business is kind of built on uncertainty. If we were in a perfect market, then there perhaps would not be a need for us as brokers because you could just turn around and lend to someone who's doing a business and everything would be fine. But what we're saying is we have to bridge that gap between the uncertainty and the going forward in the economy. The economy will die if you don't make the necessary investments, right? And we seem to know all the problems there. There's no shortage of people telling you what the problems are. But what has happened is that nobody wants to execute on the solution. So we're saying to people, listen, you are already in business. Take that risk right now. But we'll help you to manage the risk. Don't shy away from it. Don't say you're not doing it. Just manage it. And we will help you to manage that risk. So in all the uncertainty that we have, there, there are opportunities. Just remember that there are opportunities, and those opportunities must be exploited because if we don't exploit it, somebody else is going to come from abroad and exploit it for us. All the growth that we have seen in telecoms is because of an opportunity that was there some time back. And I can bet you right now is an opportunity right now in, in energy, and somebody's going to come, up, come, come forward and exploit that. So, what we're saying is. Don't worry so much about the uncertainty. Help, get help, and help to manage the risk away from what you have right now to how you can turn the, 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 the uncertainty into an opportunity. How do you differentiate yourself um, from your competitors? Because in, an, in a liberalized economy where you know, you're competing, um, customers and clients would want to, you know, what differentiates v VMBS, wealth management, from all the rest? Tell me about that. So our, our big differentiating point is this. We will find opportunities for you, the investor. So we are going to go out there, and when we talk to persons who are looking to raise funds, we are going to find, create the best structure for them, and one that will also give you the benefits. So we're making both sides happy. So we, at the end of the day, will be the, the good guy. So we'll differentiate ourselves from the others who are just probably just trying to go out there and just sell you what is available, the run-of-the-mill stuff. We are not just trying to sell you the run-of-the-mill stuff. We are creating opportunities for you. So when the party out there is struggling to raise capital and struggling with the dollar at 100 and struggling with all the issues, we're helping them to structure their business so that they can make it profitable. And then we're turning around to you and say, listen, invest in these businesses because they are the ones that we think will be the future of what we're doing right now. So we are not at all the same as the other brokers around, we think, that would just sell you all the um, over-the-counter regular um, products. We are looking to create products that will give you good returns, good risk-adjusted returns going forward. And for the persons who are borrowing money or look, need to raise capital, we're going out there to find the best opportunities for them. How does the global marketplace affect your business? Because um, globally, um, Europe has, has been struggling. Um, the United States is trying to get back on, on track a little bit better in terms of job creation, but still not very strong yet. Um, how does it impact 
or what you sell? So the global marketplace is a big problem for, for everybody. But ironically, it's sort of the best opportunity for struggling economies like Jamaica. Right. And everybody asks the same question as to why. So while you might have problems getting tourists from some of these areas, which is your major source of income, because they, these, these, these places are, are not doing as well as they wanted to do. So the tourists from there, tourist inflows from there would fall. There's, a, there's another side of it that creates a big opportunity for us. The funding that all these central banks around the world have put in the economy finds a the, finds the way around the world. So the US central bank would put funding in the economy to the point where interest rates on a 10-year instrument now is 1.7%, right? In Japan, they're doing the same thing. In Europe, they're doing the same thing. And so the assets there, the yields on the assets there are pretty low. So what those investors do is to turn to other areas, other emerging markets, and look for investment opportunities there. So someone who has cheap monies from the central banks in Europe would turn to Jamaica and say, listen, let me make an investment in Jamaica because the returns here are much higher than what I would get if I invested in my, co in my country. Of course, they would be taking some more risk, but the spread above the returns in their country would be significant to take care of a lot of the risk that they're taking. So we, we really do much better when the world's economies are bad because the low interest rates that come from situations like that comes into our economy and helps us. And if you want, you, you don't have to look far for the examples. Right now, you hear that Jamaica's economy is pretty bad. And you hear that all the, um, all the negatives about no IMF deal and so on. But look on what is happening to our instrument that is on a 10-year, our 10-year instrument right now. The cost of funding for a 10-year instrument is about 6.5% right now in Jamaica. 65 to 7%. And we're doing badly. Now, if, we, if the world economy wasn't doing that badly, there's no way we would be raising funds at 6.5%. So the point I'm making is that while, when we have situations like this in the world, there's an opportunity that is created and we, our role is to exploit that opportunity. And that is, I think, the part that we, we should be on right now. What is the greatest level of success that you think that this wealth era has achieved since you came on board? So the biggest thing for me since I came on board is the movement away from strictly intermediation or the repo business. We were earning almost 100% of our revenues from intermediation with the repo business. When, when we were doing that, we were taking substantial financial capital risk. Now what has happened is that we've moved to the point where we're earning probably about 60% of our total revenues from the repo markets now. So we're down from 100 to about 60%. And we're taking significantly less capital risk. So the big thing for me is a diversification of the revenue streams of the VM Wealth Management and of the capital requirements, diversification of the capital requirements. So instead of using all the financial, only financial capital, we're using a lot less of financial capital and a lot more of human capital. That's the biggest change for me. and sports wants you to learn while you watch and so the number one cable news and sports channel in the island brings you the best news and sports documentaries in documentary corner weekdays at 3 p.m. improve your knowledge of world events by watching the largest catalog of news and sports documentaries anywhere in the island on cable news and sports weekdays at 3 p.m. the documentary corner is aired on Sundays at 10 a.m. Are you having a wedding, a funeral, a graduation, or just about any other function? Then let InFocus Productions provide you with professional video and photographic services from anywhere in the island at the best possible price. InFocus Productions also offer PA system and projector screen rentals. 
call us at 949-5326, 949-4331, or 276-7825. So for all your video and photographic services, plus PA system and projector screen rentals, it's In Focus Productions, where your function is in our focus. Join Cable News and Sports on Mondays at 6.20 p.m. for UN in Action. UN in Action gives you a glimpse at some of the work of the United Nations as they seek to reduce poverty and foster development in developing countries across the globe. UN in Action every Monday at 6.20 p.m. on your News and Sports Authority, Cable News and Sports. Every Monday at 6.05 p.m., Cable News and Sports brings you Inside the World Bank. Get an insight into the mission of the World Bank as they fund some of the world's major projects to assist in economic development. We estimate at the bank that even a mild epidemic will reduce world GDP by 0.7. Inside the World Bank, Mondays at 6.05 p.m. on your News and Sports Authority, Cable News and Sports. Mutual Visibility Society is a part of a group, right? This VMBS has been around for 130 odd years. Yes. That is significant because it, so it, it shows the longevity of the idea, so yes. creating the, this empire, so to speak. It, it must help you significantly against some of your competition to have this history behind you. And it certainly does. And we, we, we love the fact that our parent is more than 130 years old. Because what that tells you about us is that our being around so long, we could not have been around so long if we are not doing something right. Our forefathers did a big, good job for us, setting the foundation for us. And I think we want to continue to build on that going forward. It gives us that big advantage when we go to the marketplace and we say we are Victoria Mutual. Because they know that the stability is there, the prudence is there, and all the risk management that is required to get us to another 130 years is on board. So we think we have a very strong brand, and the fact that we're also a mutual means that a lot of the benefits that we, a lot of the things that we, money that we make, goes back to our, um, to, our, to our shareholders, which in this case are our members. So remember now, in a mutual, the, the members are the shareholders. And the benefits that we make from all, all the, you know, the returns that we make from all the business that we do goes right back to our members at the end of the day. What is the greatest challenge you face, Devon, as the, the man at the helm of this um, wealth management arm? When you sit down, when you come into work each morning, what are some of the major challenges you face as the man directly responsible? for driving this arm forward. Right. So we're, 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 we have created a new business model. And in this business model, there is no sort of free lunch. Every day when you come in, you have to find a new opportunity. So you have to be following the news, not just here locally, but around the world, and try to get that feel as to what opportunities are there in any crisis that you see. So the first thing you see is crisis. But the next side of it is opportunity. So I have to kind of think now along with my team as to how we're going to turn this crisis in an into an opportunity that will benefit us and our members going forward. So every day I get up, I have to put on my creative hat and we have to find another way to make things work. And that is something that I like. I mean, it kind of gets me going every day when you know you have to do something different and at the end of the day, the rewards will come. When, they get, when the government gets up and the dollar is at 100 and there seems to be no solution, we have to find opportunities, right? When the IMF comes and they put conditionalities that are required to make the deal worth it going forward, and this is not to blame the IMF because we think the IMF has its role to play. When the, when the deal breaks down, it's not just the IMF's problem, it's our problem. I am saying we're here to find new opportunities to kind of get us from that point. So that is what my challenge is on a daily basis. Now, one of the things that would affect your business model, I think, is the ability 
to allow to inform customers um, about the new things that you're doing, the new opportunities, and so on. Um, how significantly do you believe that you're engaging with your customers? How are there any new ways of trying to engage with your customers to say, hey, VMBS Wealth Management is doing this and that and that and that, so that there is not this um, sitting down and, fe and feeling fearful of the future, but a realization that I'm a part of VM Wealth Management, there are many opportunities for me um, that I can exploit. How do you impact their consciousness and to ensure that they are constantly made aware of what it is that you provide? Right. So, so what we've done as a group, the Victoria Mutual Group, is that we've put for ourselves on a part of financial education, education for our members and the wider public. You might remember our oneness campaign. That campaign up to now we still get good feedback on it because a lot of the things that it has taught people are things that they might have known but they just might not have focused on. So what we're saying to the investing public is that start your savings an as an opportunity right now and then have become a saver, you will become an investor. And so what VM Wealth aims to do is to build on what the building society has done. Because if you look on the life cycle of the saver, he will start out of leaving school into a job, he starts to save. For the most part, one of the things he's looking for is a house. VM, what VMBS comes in, gives him a loan to get that house. A couple of years later, the house moves up in value and he's looking to leverage that asset and become a bigger investor in other assets. So he's now looking at bonds, stocks, mutual funds, and all those other assets that we sell. And so what we've said to, the, to, to, our, to our members is, listen, follow our path, right? Listen to our financial education that we're giving you, right? We communicate to them by new, in the newspaper, on the air. We go on Facebook. We do stuff on um, email blasts. So we have all kind of means of telling people about stuff. And we send them notes to kind of help them to understand what these things are about. Right? So if you don't have knowledge of a certain thing, we'll send you a writing on it. Our research team will send you a writing on it. And you read it up and you might, hmm, now I understand. Right? And we invite you to call into any of our advisors and we'll give you help if you need it. So what we're saying is our strategy is to go with the route of financial education first. And having done that, we think that people will now, on the other side of it, come to us to buy up the products and services required. If you have to put on your thinking cap every day, yes. there is also the other side to Devon Barrett, a family. Yeah. How do you balance between a professional career that demands so much of your time, obviously, and your family life? Tell us about it. So, you, you really have to just try to find some time. I honestly will tell you that I don't think I do the best job at that, but I have to find time to you know, play with children sometimes, you know, go to three take kids, them, yeah. three kids, yeah. and I have to take them out, I have to make them enjoy themselves, and I have to kind of keep the balance going so that you know, they, they don't feel left out, right? And in turn, they kind of bring balance too because having done that they, they, you kind of use them as sort of stress relief of sorts because if you're focused on business a whole for eight or nine or ten or even 16 hours of the day you will need a time to create a little break for yourself and that break time with the, with children or with family or with friends is something that i think is necessary all the time to kind of keep you focused and get you rejuvenated for the next day now, as a Kingston College old boy, you must be sports oriented. I don't know any Kingston College old boy that is not sports oriented. Tell us about what you are and what do you do in your spare time? So I am definitely sports oriented, but now I'm much, much more a follower of sports than a player of sports. Okay, you used to play? My latest playing year was in t uh, tennis. Okay. Right, and that was fun for me. You know, it's a whole heap of running and it's a lot of fun. Right. And I did track back in school, you know, I never made it to the champs. I've always found a couple of people better than I was. But I love track and field. I really love track and field. And champs is a big thing in track and field. And you as the, the other side of the rival will understand that. 
it is something that is always going. If you look on champs over the last how many years, you will see that when Casey is not doing well, somebody else picks up the slack and the competition goes on, right? And so to me, champs, I'm not here to say I go champs just to watch Casey alone. I really go to watch good performances. Of course I want Casey to always win, but I really want good performances to come out, and we have seen a lot of that in recent times with our sports, track and field sports stars. So you're a track and field hardcore fan? I'm a big fan of track and field. Okay. Now, um, in wrapping up this interview, um, there must be a goal in mind as you look to the company that you're a part of and to see you know, what the possibilities are. How do you expect Jamaica, a little bit um, um, to the national scene, how do you help expect Jamaica to recover from what we call, in my own view, a precarious position? Because we have a huge debt, as you had indicated before. We have a dollar that is struggling immensely. We have an economy that is sluggish. And you, do, you did say that there are opportunities, right? Now, as a financial person, how is it possible for Jamaica to bounce back in a real way to provide some added impetus to its people? Absolutely. I think Jamaica is right at that point for the turnaround. I think we're at the bottom of the barrel right now, and this is the best time for you to try to go up. right? And when we look on the things that can be done, not, not all of it in the short term, but the things that can be done that can really make us successful, I think we have a great opportunity to bounce really high. And let me give it to them quickly so we know where we're going. The energy cost situation right now, if we can get energy cost of 50% of where it is right now, that will be a significant game changer in our economy. Now, is that going to happen in the next two, three, six months or a year? No, it's not. But over time, if we can get this done over the next two, three, four years with the diversification of the, the, the input and so on, and we, we can cut the cost significantly of energy. That's the big, big one for me. The second big one for me is the import substitution. With our food bill is just too high, our energy bill is just too high, all of that is too high. And it's an opportunity for us to convert our economy into a local one, agriculture, it's a big opportunity for us right now. And I'm saying that there's a lot that we can do right now to turn that around. And to me, I see this as a low-hanging opportunity. And the reason why it's so low-hanging is because if you go right now to any of the, the, the ports, you will see significant, Im significant imports. And you simply will say, I can produce that too. You're going to see biscuits, you're going to see water, you're going to see all those things that you can produce right here. And my point is that import substitution can be a big, big target for us. And the only thing that is required to get that going right now, outside of the energy situation, I keep saying outside of that because we understand the issue there, is the need for capital. And if you focus the capital in that direction, right, and you, you take out all the bureaucracy and so on, you will get that import substitution right now. So to me, those two big, those are the two big things that I'd work on, and I would see this as a big opportunity for Jamaica. Devon Barrett, thank you very, very much for stopping by and talking to us on Spotlight. We wish no you all the best in your endeavors, and certainly, uh, this has been a very uh, thought-provoking interview. Really enjoyed the discussion, and I wish you well at Victoria Mutual Wealth Management. Thank you very much, and look forward to talking to you again. All the very best. All right, good, good.